Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to your Lunch Break Live. My name's Ivana, if you're new here. If you're not, thank you for coming back. Today is June the 10th, and by now, I would assume that most of us know that June is Pride Month. If, if you didn't know that, you've learned something new already today. Today, I am joined by State Representative Neil Rafferty. Uh, Neil represents some parts of the Birmingham region in the east and north region of Birmingham, and he is here today to talk a little bit about being the only openly gay member of the Alabama legislature, talk about some of the legislation that affected the LGBTQ community uh, this past session, and just some of his other work because he is a veteran. He's a Marine, I believe. And if I get that wrong, Neil, let me know. And he's doing a lot of and he's doing a lot of work here on preventing veteran suicide. So a lot of a lot of things here to talk about, Neil. Thank you for taking some time to join me today. Yeah, thank you for uh, for having me on today. Um, you know, first, I, I want to ask you that you do not have a very long list of predecessors that are openly LGBTQ plus in the Alabama legislature. Do you feel a sense of maybe responsibility or do you feel that you have a platform in the legislature to to make your voice and the voices of the LGBTQ community heard? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'll just go back to the remark that there's not a long line of uh, predecessors or, or anybody that would have set the precedent for LGBTQ people to be at the table uh, in the Alabama State House. Um, I know Patricia Todd was my predecessor and she was the one that really uh, broke through that, that, that glass ceiling, if you will, in one way or another, and uh, kind of made it where um, it became uh, a little bit more acceptable uh, and a little bit more, you know, it's an incremental process to get to that that point. Um, but she kind of paved the way for, especially me. Um, I know that when she uh, was stepping down, I was getting a little nervous because uh, I was afraid of losing that LGBTQ voice down there. That's ultimately one of the reasons why I decided to step up and throw my hat in the ring and uh, and try to, to go down to the state house because I was concerned about not having that voice at the table there. Um, that became evident this past session um, with a couple of bills there <clears throat> that really affect the LGBTQ community, particularly targeting the trans part of our community. And I wanted to make sure and, you know, my role there as an LGBTQ person became uh, even more apparent because I was somebody that has been working with the trans community and the LGBTQ community at large for a long time now. So I knew that I would be able to bring something to the table to lift up those voices of those uh, those trans individuals that those bills were targeting. Um, it was, a, it was a tough job, uh, particularly because the trans issues seem to be, while they're not new in the grand scope of human history or the experience of human diversity, um, I would say that it is uh, new to some people here in, in Alabama. So it took a, a lot of uh, education, so, you know, sitting there talking with folks, seeing where they're meeting them, where they are, and then letting them know where I'm at with it. So it ultimately, well, it ended up working with some and ended up uh, not working with others. So. Well, and and we'll get we'll get into that in a minute because that is a very uh, that's a loaded conversation, one that we could have for a, a long time. But you talk about running for office, about what made you decide to run for office, and uh, you served as a corporal in in the Marine Corps. You also have done a lot of work with Birmingham AIDS Outreach, and running for office, I've never done it, but I would imagine it's hard in general. Yes. Then you add on again, you've had a very background of a lot of different things, but maybe not politics. So you go in to run for office. And then on top of that, you are openly gay, not with a lot of openly gay colleagues in the legislature. How was running for office in that environment? Running for office was uh, challenging for a lot of reasons, but I would say that it wasn't so bad um, with the, 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 the gay thing, um, the quote unquote, a gay thing. I would say that, uh, the issue was probably just not having um, much experience with campaigning or politics, but that was something that was beautiful about my campaign is that I had a lot of people that came around me um, to help help uh, push the uh, push us forward. People that had no experience with politics either, but uh, represented a broad spectrum of other talents um, and and uh, and valuable uh, insights that help push. Uh, push the, my candidacy forward. Um, you know, and like you said, when I was working with Birmingham AIDS Outreach, there were things that, you know, while being LGBTQ and losing that at the, uh, losing that, 
losing somebody who was a member of that community um, was really important and was a driver for why I wanted to run for office. There was also the structural and systemic issues that I saw with healthcare and my job and my role at Birmingham AIDS Outreach, working in public health. Um, that I knew were insurmountable for our clients who were um, who were hurting. Uh, so I knew that there was multiple reasons and multiple problems that I I knew were happening here in Alabama that had political answers to them. Um, and that's that's another reason why uh, I was able to uh, really rally up a, a lot of support and be able to push my candidacy forward and and ultimately prevail. Um, <clears throat> So and here we are. We're still still setting that groundwork. Still still pushing forward uh, with making those uh, systemic and structural changes uh, occur and happen. So now you were elected in 2018, and whenever I think of 2018, 2019, I say last year because it, the last I guess two years at this point have been such a wash. Uh, so you've definitely had a really interesting time in office. Just take away your personal life and your personal uh, missions, just with the world in a totally different place. But this year, the Alabama legislature took on several LGBTQ plus related legislation, like you said, many that affected the trans community. There was a lot of legislation that people kind of refer to as culture war type legislation. So I want to know, and we can talk about specific bills as well, but how did you feel being somebody in the legislature? Again, you're the only openly uh, gay member of the legislature. How did you feel when those legislation came in? Did you feel like you could lend a voice to people who are maybe not as educated about the community or maybe who didn't have any friends prior to you coming into the legislature that were part of that community? I think uh, not just that that was something that I could do, but something I had to do. Um, what was kind of lending that voice was I felt like, you know, as, as these bills were coming, there was a lot of people who were looking at me to, to fill those answers because they, you know, even people who were very sympathetic but didn't quite have the language or quite have the, the way to really express um, why they felt these bills were so bad because it, it's such a, a kind of a new thing to them. Um, I felt it was incumbent, part of my duty um, to, as not just as a representative uh, who represents all the people in my district, but also as a uh, LGBTQ member who has experienced a lot of these similar kind of things that um, uh, that 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 made me want to make sure that I was educating and making sure that these people um, had a had a chance. So just really kind of trying to explain how bad some of these bills were, um, and and how. And how how negative the impact could be. I mean, I think that that was really the case. Um, is that they didn't really know how serious some of these issues would uh, would affect uh, everyday people and families here in Alabama. I feel like we hear from a lot of people who say, "Look." I might be ignorant about this issue. I don't want to be. I want to know how to properly speak about it. I want to use the correct language. I don't want to, I don't want to be offensive, but I also just don't know. Did you get a lot of those kind of, did you have a lot of those kind of conversations? Yes, I did. Um, particularly, I know I remember in health committee, we were discussing one of the bills and I kind of, you know, asked the question, well, what would we do about non-binary? um uh, individuals in this situation and everyone was just kind of what was that you, you kind of felt like a what, what's that real quick and i had several of my colleagues come up to me afterwards and kind of ask like what was that you said like and wanted some clarification as far as what non-binary meant so a lot of this stuff is is new to people that doesn't mean once again doesn't mean it's new in the grand scheme of human history and the diversity of human experience um, it just means that it's new to some people um, right now. So <clears throat> that was a really important issue where I can be approachable um, and respectful to where people were uh, and then work with them to uh, to get them on the, uh, on the other side of the issue. So now now some of those issues that came up this year in the legislation that we're talking about, I've got a list. I can I have to have a list because there's quite a few uh, in front of me. We've got one that uh, I believe did pass about removing homophobic language from uh, sexual ed curriculums. Mm -hmm. There was the uh, what is now a law of banning trans people from competing on sports teams that uh, are part of their identified gender. And then there was also the big issue that actually didn't come up before the end of the session about hormonal treatment for for trans people who are minors. So I would love to hear to hear some of your thoughts on those, especially the ones that is now a law and, and again, another one that has passed. 
Well, particularly with the, the sex education law, you know, that one was just poorly and terribly outdated uh, was one of the, the things. I think that law was written in the, the early 70s here. Um, it is incredibly homophobic. It's not even medically or um, scientifically accurate or relevant anymore. So that was a huge win. Um, and once again, I would like to thank uh, Representative Laura Hall of Huntsville for pushing that for so many years to get that changed. Um, the other bill with the, 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 what I would call the trans athlete bill, this bill, um, you know, had a lot of that kind of covert messaging where they were trying to say, you know, the Republicans were trying to say that this is protect women and girls. But then, you know, I had colleagues who have daughters who play sports who said this has never this has never been an issue. It's never been brought up. So why are we why are we making a law to pass something that's not even a, a real problem? Um, couldn't really get a good answer on that one. But uh, other than just saying, like, well, we want to prevent it from happening. Um, the other one would be the the bill that did ultimately did not pass, which was uh, SB 10 or HB 1. Uh, from last year, which dealt with um, trans uh, youth health care, as well as um, uh, the kind of role of trusted adults in the schools for 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 these kids to kind of come to and speak with, um, and that kind of confidentiality that would be held held there um, between the uh, the child and that trusted adult. Um, this bill was problematic for a lot of reasons. For one, it was a you know, again, it was a solution in search of a problem. Uh, it was addressing things that did not happen in the state that are not part of standards of care. It tried to make illegal something, stuff that doctors do uh, with in conjunction with the family and a team of health care providers all surrounding the child, uh, the, the child or the minor to make the best decision moving forward for, for what that what that might be. Um, you know, it's a part of the standards of care and standards of practice for um, for several major medical associations. Uh, that the gender affirming model is has the best outcome, particularly for mental, um, <laughs> mental and, and emotional uh, well-being. Um, the other part of that bill that was really terrible was that it forced nurses, school nurses, guidance counselors, teachers, once again, anybody that's a trusted adult to out a child if they even suspected that the uh, that the child was uh, trans or just gender nonconforming, um, you know, and I probably try to bring out the example of you know of me coming out right. So when I came out, it was something that I did on my own terms and in my own time. Um, you know, I first came out to my sister. My sister said, "Don't come out to your parents yet." She didn't say, "Don't come out to your parents." My but older sister said, you know, make sure that you're ready when you do come out to them. And I think that that's a really important thing when we're talking about particularly um, with uh, with youth is that they have to be in control of, of how and when they, uh, they they disclose that information because it's incredibly private. It's incredibly personal and everybody's in a different circumstance. Coming out's a process. It's, there's not one way it happens for one person or another. Um but it's a process that that per, that the individual needs to be in in, in control of. Um, like I said, just because it's so private, so intimate, and it's also an, an issue where that where that person's going to understand their circumstances, uh, the safety of their circumstances, um, and and make that decision based off of of, of that reality. Uh, an example I set for <clears throat> is if we want to talk about um, homeless youth. So we know that homeless youth, uh, approximately 40% of them are LGBTQ identified. Um, and there's various reasons why that is. But in the unfortunate reality is some of these, these children get kicked out of their home when they come out um, or run away because they're subject to abuse. So that's something that you really need to keep in mind and making sure that that child has, has the, uh, the ability to kind of keep, keep control um, of, uh, of, of, of coming out. Um, and uh, how the, what that process looks like for for them. So well, and we know that you you're a member of the LGBTQ plus community. We've talked about that. You're also a m member of the veterans community. Again, served right. as a corporal in the in the Marine Corps. So you definitely have a. I, I would assume you feel that you represent several communities up there, and you have several different missions. That's correct. Yes, um, I do. Uh, so I I do. <coughs> Excuse me. So I do have several um, different communities. I got a lot of uh, different varying experiences throughout my lifetime, which have put me in uh, in touch with uh, a bunch of different communities. Um, 
particularly with the veterans community, one big issue to me is a uh, veteran suicide. This is something that has uh, affected me personally um, with uh, more of my friends. I've lost more friends now in, from suicide than I have from combat or, or anything uh, or any other kind of service related um, injury, which is a tough fact to kind of swallow when you really want to think about it. Um, but there's one impact, there's one, you know, while I've lost several friends or several of my, my former uh, Marine buddies to, to suicide, there's one where uh, we were very close friends and he was, uh, and we tried to go look for him and we weren't able to find him. And, uh, and then we, we heard that he, how he had passed away and it was, it was a very devastating blow for us and uh, for all my, my brothers and sisters in arms who were, who were out there trying to find him that day. Um, so this has kind of propelled a, a whole other uh, set of my priorities in addressing the, um, the issue and the problem with veteran suicide here in the state, not just here in the state, but across, across the country. We know that male veterans are 1.5 times more likely to commit suicide. Female veterans are like something in the 2.7% more likely to, uh, to commit suicide. So uh, this is a very important issue and we need to take care of those who bore the battle. And I think that, you know, making sure that we hear the, the, the veteran community understand what it is that they need, um, listen to them when they tell us what it is that they need and what they want, and then be able to make our services uh, crafted around that idea. You know, I don't want to come in and tell them, uh, this is what you need, this is what you need to do. Instead, we need to be listening to them to see what it is they want and what it is they need, and then kind of crafting and tailoring services um, and service delivery based off of, of that. And that was ultimately the goal of the Veteran Suicide Task Force. It's now a part of the Governor's Challenge or the Alabama Challenge to deal with veteran suicide. Um, and these are initiatives that have you know, started off kind of slow, but I've really been building up and uh, I'm really happy to see all the momentum um, and the force behind them now. So stay a lot of and uh, ho hope, 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 to, hope to really have some impact and meaning there. So a lot of work that uh, that you have done, your colleagues have done this year. I know it's been a long year for everybody. And uh, the session is the session is over right now. Again, it is it's June. It is summer to summer for you guys as well. And again, June is Pride Month. Do you have any way that you're you're expecting to celebrate this month? Any events that you're taking uh, part of? Yeah, so um, I will say that uh, where there's a Pride event going on this Saturday um, here. Uh, it's Pride in the streets. It'll be on Forty uh, First Street in Avondale. Uh, we'll be locking down the street, and it'll be a, a fun outdoor um, festival. And uh, and it, it, sh it will be family friendly. So. Um, you know, come on down to Avondale, come on down to District 54 and celebrate Pride with us. <laughs> awesome. That is this Saturday. Again, we'll leave all that information here in the comments. But Representative Rafferty, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing just several of your different experiences uh, with us today. Happy to do it. Thank you for having me on, Ivana. Be good. Thank you. Hey, I'm going to try. Thank you so much, Representative. Everybody watching, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow.